we get started? Okay, so uh, today we're going to start at what the first of two lectures on extension theorems. That doesn't mean we won't use estimates, it just means that the extensions will not have estimates. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> what's the extension problem? Well, by now it's uh, familiar to us, but let me state it anyway. So X is a complex manifold, uh, say, do I, I think I'll just stick with line bundles for extension. So L to X, a holomorphic line bundle. Um, and the question is, so is the restriction map uh, oh, and one more thing I need. Uh, S in X should be some kind of analytic subset, but for our lecture, we'll just assume that it's a complex submanifold. Just for simplicity, but most of what we do will work for singular things as well. So remember, a complex submanifold is something that's locally cut out by a bunch of functions, the number of functions is uh, the co-dimension of the submanifold, and the functions can serve as local, differ as local part of a local coordinate system in the neighborhood. Their differentials are independent. So we can get a restriction map uh, from the sections of L over X to uh, the sections of, the, of L over S. And the, the the question problem is whether or not this map is surjective. In other words, given any holomorphic section on S, can you find one on X whose restriction to S is the one you were given? <clears throat> so in general, uh, so unlike the smooth case, in general, uh, the answer is negative. Uh, so <clears throat> the simplest example we've already discussed uh, indirectly, uh, but that's if, uh, for example, X is a compact complex manifold, uh, L is trivial, and the cardinality of S is at least two. So S consists of more than one point. Uh, since every holomorphic function is, is constant on a compact manifold, uh, you can't distinguish two points. But on the other hand, uh, so if S, well, you have to be a little careful how you say this, but if S is discrete, for instance, that'll be good enough. Um, it could happen that, that S itself is a compact submanifold, uh, so I, I actually need it to be discrete. If S has positive dimension, every component of S has positive dimension, uh, and it's connected, then, uh, then the answer is yes, because both, in both situations, the, uh, whole, the set of holomorphic functions are constant. Okay. Yes. Is yeah. yeah, maybe connected is better. Thank you. You're right. S not connected. That's maybe the better way to say it. Thanks, Debrach. S not connected. So, for example, discrete. Uh, maybe a slightly more interesting example. which I'll leave as one, this will be the first exercise later, is that you let x be uh, p1, and l will be the hyperplane bundle, which uh, Vamsi yesterday called O of 1. And s, so this is a submanifold, it's basically a set of points, 
And so it should have at least three points. So this is uh, exercise. This will be exercise one. Okay, so actually it's not so easy to come up with uh, interesting examples, for example, of uh, compact Riemann surface in P2. I, I don't even know if it's... The extension problem might by accident be uh, always solvable for S being a compact surface in P2. I tried for a while to cook up an example. Uh, you need some algebraic geometry to uh, count sections. It's a riemann roch theorem. Uh, but I wasn't able to quite do it. And eventually, I became convinced that it's probably not possible to find an example. But this is a different kind of uh, phenomenon than we're interested in. So what we're going to primarily focus on today is uh, that's supposed to be one. So I'm going to focus on strongly pseudo-convex manifolds. So remember, recall that uh, x is strongly pseudo-convex if uh, X has uh, a strictly plurisubharmonic exhaustion. And so in this case, um, you can always solve the interpolation problem, and that's what I'm that's the main thing I'm gonna prove today. Theorem. Actually, I'm going to restrict the interpolation problem, even though it's true for general line bundles and even vector bundles, I'll just restrict to functions. So let's let x be a strongly pseudo-convex uh, manifold, uh, and s in x a submanifold. Complex, of course. Uh, then, for every holomorphic function on S, there exists a holomorphic function on X whose restriction to S is the initial function on S. Okay, so now we, we will see a lot of the techniques that we've been developing up till now. Okay, so let's fix some uh, strictly PSH exhaustion row. Uh, we're going to need a Kähler metric to define some L2 norms. So I'm going to take uh, the Kähler form to be uh, the Hessian of rho, essentially. So I D D bar of rho. This will be our Kähler metric. Okay, now um, let's choose uh, an open cover. So maybe I should say open sets. Uh, UJ, say J going from 1 to infinity, so such that um, the following properties hold. So first of all, uh, this is a locally finite collection of open sets. Maybe I'll start with this. So S is contained in the union over J of U sub J. Two, the collection UJ is locally finite, by which I mean that uh, uh, every point of the union of UJ is contained in finitely many of the UJ. Okay? Um, uh, 
Uh, and I'm going to choose these open sets uh, such that, um, so xj, yj, so from uj into uh, um, vj inside cn, this n is the dimension of x. Uh, this is a holomorphic, biholomorphic map, so this is a coordinate chart, and such that uh, the part of S that lies inside UJ is the, zero, the common zero set of all the components of YJ. So it's YJ1 equals uh, Y, say, N minus K, J equals zero. So this K is the dimension of S. You're given these functions by the definition of submanifold. And <clears throat> maybe that's all I need. So and now let's let let U0 be another open set, which is just the complement of x minus s. Okay? So just all the points outside s is the remaining open sets. So now I have a collection of open sets uj, j going from 0 to infinity. Um, and now maybe I should draw a picture uh, for us to go along with. So, so x is the blackboard, and maybe this is s. And this is maybe one of our open sets. Uh, let's make it a little bit different. Well, no, it doesn't really matter. Here's our set UJ. Uh, and then we have some, some uh, function F. So I guess let's so let F in... Uh, O of s be the function to be extended. Okay, so we've got this f defined on s, and now what I'm going to do is extend this f to the neighborhood u j. Okay? So the way I'm going to do that is um, so I'm going to let f j uh, say of xj, yj, be simply f of xj. So if you imagine this coordinate system, the level sets of the coordinates yj looking like this. Uh, so yj are coordinates along these things. Sorry, the level sets are the other way. So the yj's are giving you coordinates in this direction. And you're basically going to define capital FJ at this point to be just follow back to S and see the value of F there. Okay. So, um, and then for F0, so this is going to be for J greater than or equal to 1. And F0, XJ, YJ, it doesn't really matter what it is. So let's just make it 0. Why not? It, Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter. Maybe I should just say Z. Okay. Uh, yeah. So these, <clears throat> all of these FJ are holomorphic on the sets UJ. Um, and so then we can we can define. Uh, functions g i j to be the differences f i minus f j. So this is a holomorphic function on the intersection of u i and u j. Okay. So, so our goal is to find functions. Oops, find. G I G J say in O of U J with two properties. So a uh, G J restricted to 
the part of S lying in UJ is identically zero. And the second property is that uh, Gij is Gi minus Gj. Okay? So these Gj, they look almost like these capital Fj. The only difference is that they, they vanish along S, whereas Fj extends little f along S. Okay, so I claim that if we can achieve this goal, then we've solved the problem. If uh, we find such, uh, and by the way, G0, it doesn't matter what it is because it doesn't meet S, so it doesn't have any properties, so it just has to satisfy this, this other thing. Okay? Uh, so if we find such Gj, then we can define F to be Fj minus Gj on Uj. So for every Uj, I define little f to be in this way. And I have to see that this makes sense. So for example, if I look on some Uk which intersects Uj, then f has a different definition there. It should be the same. But if you look at Fj minus Gj minus Fk minus Gk, so Fj minus Fk is Gjk, but uh, Gj minus Gk is also Gjk. So this means that the function is well defined. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, as usual with these extension problems, uh, I'm first going to find a smooth collection of functions gj which satisfy these things. Okay? Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I define gj tilde as follows. So let's let uh, chi j be a partition of unity which is subordinate to the cover u j. Okay. And then I let g j tilde be the sum over all, let me use my same letters so I don't get confused, um, okay. over all, uh, I already use different letters, so over all i, of chi i uh, g k chi k. I mean, I, just in case I get confused, because it's a bit technical. I'm going to take uh, these holomorphic functions, multiply them by these elements of the partition of unity, and I sum over all possible j. Okay? So this is some smooth function. In fact, this sum is, is locally finite because the uj, these guys are supported in uj, and so, uh, or my, it doesn't matter where they're supported. Uh, at, at any point of them, at any point, all but finitely many are zero. Uh, good. Okay, so now let's check that, well, this condition is satisfied because gij is fi minus fj, and both of these are extensions of little f from s. So along s, they're the same, and so you get zero. So, so this g tilde i restricted to s intersect ui is identically to zero. And now let's look at g tilde i minus g tilde say, k, or let's make it j. Uh, okay, so this is going to be the sum. So g tilde i is the sum over k of chi k g i k, right? And then g tilde j is the sum over k of chi k 
uh, G, J, K. So this uh, G, I, K, so G, J, K is the negative of G, K, J. If you look at this, you interchange I and J, you get a different sign. So this is plus G, K, J. And then G, I, K plus G, K, J, the K cancels. So this will be the sum over k of chi k g i j. That's independent of k, and the sum of a partition of unity is 1. So this is g i j. So we have our smooth solution, but that's not good enough because uh, we need a holomorphic solution. Okay, so now we're going to try to correct these does. So the idea is to correct them all with a single function. So we want to find one function u so that uh, g tilde i minus u has, is holomorphic and has the properties that we want. Okay. Um, so, well, this u, you can guess, is going to be the solution of some d-bar equation. So let's try to find the, the data. So let's take d-bar of this relation. So d bar g tilde i minus g bar d bar g tilde j, that's equal to d bar of g i j, but the g i j is holomorphic. Right? It's a difference of holomorphic functions on the intersection. So that's equal to zero on u i intersection u j, which just means uh, that the form alpha, which is defined to be d bar g tilde i, on ui uh, is a globally defined uh, zero one form. Okay. Now we would like to find a solution equation uh, d bar u equals alpha, which also vanishes along s. So to conclude, need uh, u solving uh, d bar u equals alpha uh, such that uh, u restricted to s is identically zero. Um, you know, in general, we've been solving this d bar equation for functions which are just in in some L2 space. So a priori, they're not everywhere defined, but the form alpha is a smooth form. It's just d bar of a smooth function locally. So it's a closed, smooth form. Uh, and so any solution u of such a, an equation is automatically smooth. So it makes sense to restrict uh, to s, to ask what the values along a set of measures zero are. Okay. Um, now, you know, we're looking for a solution, so this form is d-bar closed. That's obvious because it's locally d-bar exact. Right? And because of the Dolbo lemma, d-bar closed is the same as locally d-bar exact. But it's not globally d-bar exact yet, but we're trying to prove. And maybe a little more. We're trying to find this u which vanishes, and that's going to be the difficulty. So. Okay, so let me make a claim. So first of all, um, if you integrate over uj the form alpha, okay, let's take the norm with respect to the metric omega, and then we divide by yj to the power of 2 times n minus k, uh, and dv sub omega, I claim that this, this quantity is finite. So this is a little more subtle than the things we've been doing before. So before, we've been guaranteeing that um, the forms alpha, where we wanted to make them vanish, where we wanted to make the solutions vanish, we guaranteed that the form alpha was actually holomorphic on a neighborhood of that set, or zero on a neighborhood of that set. Right? And that's much easier to deal with. Here, that's not true. Uh, this alpha is, is non-zero 
Now, except possibly on the set, but a priori you can't assume too much. So we're going to have to go back to the construction of this alpha. Okay, so let me uh, prove the claim. And this is the really tricky part. So first, let's look at this G, say, J, M. Right? If you restrict it to U, J, intersect, well, it's, it's de only defined on U, J, intersect U, M. Um, but if you restrict it to U, J, intersect U, M, intersect S, then it's identically zero. So we said that these G, I, J, they vanish along S wherever they're defined, the part of S where they're defined. Okay, um, but in this neighborhood, this S is cut out by a collection of functions, right? Um, so this, because this is a holomorphic function, um, if it vanishes on the common zero set of these things, then it means that this G, J, M can be written as a sum of at L going from 1 to n minus k of some holomorphic functions fjm sub L times the L coordinate of y, yj, for instance. So right. this is the vanishing condition. Okay? You just expand in a power series, and you'll see. Okay. And then the point is, of course, that this fjm L are holomorphic on uj intersect um. On the other hand, if we look at this g tilde j, right, that's the sum over all m, but it's a finite sum, and then the sum l going from 1 to n minus k of the chi m, and then this g j m, which is going to be F J M L Y L J. So then alpha is just D bar J, D bar of G tilde sub J. Uh, that's going to be uh, the sum over M, sum L going from 1 to N minus K. Everything here is holomorphic. The only thing that's not holomorphic because this guy, so this is D bar chi M, F J M L, Y L J. So now you see that alpha indeed vanishes along S. Okay, so that's good. We have a, a form alpha which is integrable, at least locally, with respect to the weight that we want, right? So if, if UJ were the whole manifold, we would be done because by Hormander's theorem, well, there's a little bit more to say here. We would try to apply Hormander's theorem here to solve the d bar equation, and the solution would have the same L2 estimate, so it would be forced to vanish. Now, of course, we, we need a weight to apply Hormander's theorem, and we also need to, a weight that works for all the uj. So that's what we're going to do next. <clears throat> so now consider the weight psi equals, so I take my row and I compose it with some function h, which I will specify in a moment, and then I'm going to add uh, chi j log mod yj to the 2 times n minus k, sum over all j. Here this h will be, is a convex rapidly increasing, and how rapidly may change. Okay. Um, so, so this term is giving you a lot of positivity. In fact, as much as you want, if, if a priori you choose h prime big enough, and we're actually going to do it a posteriori. Okay, doesn't matter. We have to investigate this second term here. Um, so, this uh, d d bar of chi j log mod y j to the 2 times n minus k. Right? So, this is going to be 
there's going to be a component which applies dd bar to the log, but log is plurisubharmonic. So I'm going to ignore that component. Uh, and then I'm going to have uh, dd bar chi j log mod yj to the 2 times n minus k. Um, and then it's going to be plus uh, d chi j wedge uh, d bar of this log, uh, log mod yj to the 2 times n minus k plus the opposite, plus uh, d of the log wedge d bar of chi j. And so I claim that all these terms are bounded. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details here. They're, they're done to some extent in the notes, and some of it's left as an exercise. But I'll try to explain uh, what's going on. So um, the tricky thing here is that, uh, you know, that you need to estimate this for all possible uh, yk, where uk intersects uj. But, but on any change of coordinate system, the functions yj and yk are related uh, by some, something which is an invertible transformation plus higher order terms. So you can actually assume that this y is sort of independent of j, you know, more or less. And then you, you sum up to a bounded factor. It's independent of j. And then when you sum over j, the partitions of unity will add this up to 1. dd bar is linear, so you're going to be taking dd bar of 1. So that's going to be 0. So you're going to get a bounded, a smooth bounded function here. Uh, maybe bounded, not smooth, but bounded. Um, could even be smooth, but I'm not completely sure about that. Okay. Uh, and then this, it's the same story here. It's, this is again a partition of unity that's getting differentiated. As long as you can observe that this quantity here is sort of independent of j up to a bounded factor, when you sum over this, these things will go away. So, so you can check the details on your own, but the point is that this is maybe greater than or equal to uh, some negative, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say it like that. It's, it's greater than or equal to some theta, so this will be a smooth, real, but possibly quite negative, one, one form. So remember, these are local calculations, so, you know, this, this thing can be smooth. It can get incredibly negative because the manifold is infinite, um, but it's doing so in a smooth way. Okay? So there's a smooth form that's giving you a lower bound. And the point is that if you can, once you know this estimate, whatever this form is, you can choose this h prime much, much bigger. Okay? So at the end of the day, uh, <clears throat> you will see that square root of minus 1 dd bar of psi can be made greater than or equal to, uh, for example, uh, the Kähler form omega. That's just, it uh, doesn't really matter what you use here, but I'm going to use omega. But I'm going to need a little bit more because, so we have been doing Hormander's theorem um, for uh, n forms, uh, n q forms. Right? Uh, now I want to deal with functions. So functions, in order to turn functions into n forms, you have to tensor with the dual of the canonical bundle and then you need a metric for that. And the metric is the volume form. And the curvature of this metric is, I think I mentioned before, is called the Ricci curvature. But here it doesn't matter what it is. You take this function, this is a function times Lebesgue measure locally, and you just take negative log of that function and take dd bar, and that's the curvature. Okay? So that's called the Ricci curve. Let me just keep calling it that. But the only important thing is that it's some smooth uh, so negative Ricci of omega plus omega. This, I can assume that psi is so positive that it's bigger uh, than, that, that H prime is so big that dd bar psi is bigger than this quantity. Or maybe I should write it as this. 
And this is the hypothesis for Hormander's theorem. Okay? So then Hormander's theorem uh, it allows you to get a function u such that d bar u equals alpha and the integral over x of u squared uh, e to the minus psi dv omega is finite. But now if you look back at the definition of psi, it's smooth, it's up here, it's some smooth thing plus something that looks like log mod of the coordinates defining h to the correct power. Uh, and now this is just Fubini's theorem. You integrate over the x variables first, you get something, and then try to integrate over the y variables, you have a singular thing. So the only way you can, it can be a finite integral is if, is if u vanishes along s. Is it clear? Any questions? So we, we've sort of been preparing for this kind of thing through various exercises and examples up until now. So maybe it's not, uh, it's, it's kind of good that we had the background, so maybe it's not so surprising, at least I hope uh, that you believe me. So just to reiterate, we, we agreed that <clears throat> this, is, this is what we need to solve the problem, but to remind you what that was, once you have this u, you let gj be g tilde j minus u. So the d bar of g tilde j is alpha, and d bar of u is also alpha, so g tilde j minus u is holomorphic, and it's globally defined. Uh, well, fj minus g tilde j minus u is globally defined. It's just to repeat what I said before. This, this technique was um, invented by the French school. It's a part of sheaf theory, uh, and it's a, really a standard technique. But what's different from general sheaf theory here is that we are not only trying to prove that this sheaf cohomology class is trivial, but we're actually in a very particular kind of sheaf. It's the sheaf of germs of holomorphic functions that vanish along S. And that makes it much harder to deal with. Uh, for example, it's not so easy to deal with this by sort of abstract nonsense of exact sequences. It's not impossible, but... Well, because this, this psi near s just looks like uh, log mod yj to the correct power. So e to the minus psi is exactly this denominator. Well, it poses a threat a priori, and we spent a fair amount of energy making sure that the threat wasn't real, that it was a psychological threat, yeah. So, you know, it's a little different from what we were doing up till now, as I said, because uh, usually we would just make these forms zero on a neighborhood of S. But this you cannot do easily here, so you can do it, but you have to invest a lot more energy than what I've done. So this may look technical, but actually it's much less technical than what you might expect to try to do. So, I don't know. Anyway. Okay, so it's good. Uh, we just saw that we can solve the interpolation problem on any strongly pseudo-convex manifold. And now, um, I would like to use that to study uh, objects of primary interest in complex analysis, the so-called Stein manifolds. I've mentioned them before. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them, which is something I promised in the first lecture. Okay, so what is a Stein manifold? A complex manifold is Stein if it satisfies the following three conditions. The first one is uh, a 
could say x. Uh, <clears throat> x is holomorphically convex. So many of you know what holomorphic convexity means. Um, it's typically you talk about a compact set and you form its holomorphic hull, and, and its holomorphic convexity means that when this hull is also a compact set. Uh, it's a nice exercise to see how you can phrase convexity using this same terminology, not holomorphic convexity. It's you, you look at a, a smaller class of functions, not the holomorphic functions, but a smaller class, and you can define convexity in this way. So that's where the name comes from. But we're actually going to use a slightly different but equivalent definition, which is the following. So, so for any uh, say gamma and x, so this is a locally finite set, a closed discrete, same thing. Uh, there exists a holomorphic function on all of x uh, such that, uh, so the limit as j goes to infinity of f of gamma j is plus infinity. So I enumerate this set in any way I want, and I should be able to find a holomorphic function which blows up along the sequence. So that's equivalent to the standard definition you see of holomorphic convexity. Uh, the second property is point separation. So for all x and y in capital X, uh, there exists a holomorphic function which distinguishes them. So this you saw, you saw this phenomenon in uh, Pingali's lecture yesterday. Uh, so it's a kind of injectivity property, uh, local injectivity for global holomorphic functions. And then the third one uh, is the immersive property or the tangent separation property. So uh, for every x in x, uh, say C complex number uh, and alpha uh, one zero form at X, so just at one point, uh, there exists uh, a global holomorphic function uh, such that uh, F of P is C and DF of P is alpha. So in other words, you could interpolate at any one point with a global holomorphic function, you could interpolate what's called a one jet. So the, the any Taylor polynomial of first order, of degree one. Uh, there's more p's than x, oh, maybe not, but I'm still going to change this to p. It's easier to erase not inside of bracket. Thank you. Okay, so now this theorem that we just proved actually almost shows us that uh, a strongly pseudo-convex manifold is Stein. Right? So. If you want to get holomorphic convexity, you take your discrete, closed discrete subset, that's a submanifold of dimension zero, and then you specify, so for example, take on gamma j, you just take j, and the theorem tells you you can find a holomorphic function whose value at gamma j is j. Okay. So you get that, that one. This second one is even easier. It's a, the submanifold is just two points. And you just take, say, 1 at 1 and 0 at the other, or just different values. You can find a holomorphic function which has different. It does not follow from the theorem we just proved, but it follows from many exercises we've done or a much simpler version of this theorem. You just want to interpolate at one point, so you don't have to worry about uh, the fact that this thing is, is not discrete, so you have to cover it with all these neighborhoods. You just use one neighborhood, which is a ball. And in that case, you can even construct this alpha to be zero 
away from some annular, so a spherical annulus that contains the point in its interior. So this is just an exercise that we've essentially already done. Okay, so this proves a famous theorem of Grauer. It's called Grauer's solution of the Levy problem. Uh, it's so let me just state it. Uh, <clears throat> So every uh, strongly pseudo-convex manifold is Stein. So let me just make a remark, and in fact the converse, it's not completely trivial, but it's what I call soft. So soft analysis versus hard analysis. In soft analysis, you don't prove any estimates. That's what makes it soft. You don't estimate, and it's soft. You can move it around a lot. Uh, it's clever, but it's not even terribly hard. Uh, you use the holomorphic convexity in a certain way. So I'm not going to go through that because this is uh, a course on L2 methods. Uh, you don't need L2 for this part. So this was sort of known for a long time, and the construction of these strongly plurisubharmonic exhaustions, for example, on domains, was you know has been done a long time ago. So, uh, good. Okay. So this. Oh, I wanted to say why is this uh, a solution of the Levy problem? So the Levy problem was mentioned by Debraj a long time ago. Uh, the Levy problem is supposed to try to characterize. Getting some feedback. Uh, supposed to try to characterize uh, something holomorphic, a holomorphic property. So, in this Stein property, or see, if you're in a domain, then property two and three are, are satisfied by linear functions. So, and linear functions are defined on the domain. So, in a domain, the only important thing is holomorphic convexity. But holomorphic convexity is a feature of the holomorphic functions, whereas we know from some amount of experience that things like convex domains are Stein. So there, there, Levy thought that there must be some geometry here, and he was right, and there was a problem to characterize something holomorphic in terms of something that's more geometric than that. And here the more geometric thing is, is plurisubharmonic exhaustions. So by now we know that exhaustion means some kind of completeness, and plurisubharmonic is a little harder initially to feel that it's a geometric condition. But if you do this, um, if you prove this theorem that Debraj stated about checking what pseudoconvexity means on the boundary of the domain, you realize that it's a statement about it's some kind of statement about curvature. So I think it's a fair it's a fair answer. And I guess the annals of mathematics also thought so because they accepted Grauert's paper. This is in the late 50s, I think, 59 or something like that. Okay, in the remaining 10 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about the... Oh, maybe, maybe I should emphasize, I should have said this before starting to talk about Stein manifolds. But what we showed um, in this proof is that uh, if we've got a holomorphic function, then we can find a, on a submanifold, then we can find an interpolant. But in fact, um, what we did was find the interpolating function in some Hilbert space. But the function, the data function, was not a priori in a Hilbert space, and it's not in the Hilbert space with the weight psi. But it's it's almost. So you could modify the weight a little bit to show that, uh, so you can find a Hilbert space which contains little f and big F. So I, I should, that's not exact, literally correct because they're different manifolds, but the same weight you can use on the sub-manifold and on the ambient manifold. Uh, but you have no, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe you know what, I'll, I'll write it as an exercise, what, I, what I'm trying to say, that'll be better. Okay, so what about compact manifolds?
So here, um, you know, the interpolation problem is, is more subtle. So for manifolds of higher codimension or, or low codimension, meaning the dimension is more than zero, uh, it's quite a tricky question whether or not you can extend holomorphic sections of line bundles from a submanifold. But for points, we have kind of a nice answer. Uh, and it was, it was mentioned by Pingali in his lecture yesterday. Um, but I will state the theorem that he said. He, he said at some point you can do much more than what you need. I'm going to state the much more theorem here. Okay. So the theorem goes like this. So <clears throat> x is going to be compact, complex manifold. And then H will be a holomorphic line bundle with a metric little h such that its curvature, the square root of minus 1 times the curvature, is a Kähler form. That means that the curvature is positive. Okay, then, so maybe before I write this, so this is the extra thing we give ourselves here, which is analogous to having a strictly plurisubharmonic exhaustion. We need an object with positive curvature. So in, these, in the Stein case, you need, it, the cur you need to be able to make the curvature incredibly huge. Here we just need one thing with positive curvature. And the only way we're going to make it huge is by multiplying by the curvature by an integer. That's all we can do. Okay, so then... Uh, then, for all holomorphic line bundles, L, uh, and all points, finite set of points, and so this is the only zero-dimensional closed submanifolds of a compact manifold are finite sets of points, and then all integers, so n-tuples of integers, say, non-negative, such that Oh, whoops, excuse me. Fine. Uh, there exists an integer m0, which actually depends on x, h, l, x1 up to xn, and d1 up to dn, such that, and now I have my such that, for all polynomials, These are um, polynomials, and the degree of pj is less than or equal to dj. Uh, and for all local coordinates, Xi and frames, uh, say uh, Ci and eta i. So Ci will be a frame for for H, and eta i will be a frame for L. Again, near Xi. And for all m greater than or equal to this critical integer, you can find a section in gamma O of x L tensor H to the tensor M such that, <clears throat> so S of Zi, Zi is, remember, is a local coordinate, so it's an n-tuple of holomorphic functions in the neighborhood of xi. The section will look like uh, the polynomial pi of zi plus big O zi to the di plus 1 times the corresponding frame, which will be a to i tensor ci to the m. That's the corresponding induced frame for this line bundle. In other words, um, 
You don't know what the line bundle is exactly that you're going to have, but you can find a section of this line bundle uh, whose dj jet is specified at xj. So the Taylor polynomial up to order j with respect to any chosen frame can be specified. So I'm not going to prove this. This is uh, more or less outlined by, by Pingali, and there have been a number of exercises where some things like this were done. And the technique is the same as doing part three. Um, yes, you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's even easier. Uh, there you can just take the trivial bundle. Okay, so maybe I just want to say, let me take a, just a minute or two. So the first corollary of this statement so is the Kodaira embedding theorem. That was uh, explained yesterday in, probably in a way that I probably wouldn't explain it, but it was probably would be clearer to people here than the way I would explain. Um, Another corollary is that uh, so on such X, every holomorphic line bundle has a meromorphic section. So, so this may or may not appeal to your uh, desires, depends on uh, what kind of things you work on. But, but maybe just to say as an example, uh, if <clears throat> so on a compact Riemann surface, uh, there exists a positively curved Uh, Hermitian holomorphic line bundle. So um, in particular, if you take the trivial bundle in this corollary, you see that, uh, oh, I should say a, an, also a, a not identically zero meromorphic section. That's important. If you take the trivial bundle and you believe this example, which I'm going to explain in a minute, it shows you that every compact Riemann surface has a meromorphic function. And that's, uh, that's actually, if once you know that, everything else about compact Riemann surfaces can be done by algebraic manipulation. So the, the whole content is in finding such a thing. So I, I would still like to just talk a little bit about how you prove this but I'm going to relegate some of it to the exercises. Okay. So what's the idea of the proof? Uh, of example. So that the main thing is something we haven't done here. Uh, but it's the following. So on a compact Riemann surface, the equation, you can, you can give yourself, uh, say, a smooth measure on the compact Riemann surface or a differential form of top degree, call it theta. And suppose you want to try to solve the equation dd bar u equals theta. So this is basically the Laplacian. So you're asking to solve Laplace's equation on, on a compact Riemann surface. So this equation has a solution uh, if and only if the average surface x, the average of theta over x is zero. Okay. So this is not a trivial theorem. This is a special case of the Hodge theorem. It's a 
about solving the Laplace's equation on compact complex manifolds, and the things we've done up till now are not enough to do that. It's a different kind of math. Uh, closely related, but different. Um, so if you, right, if you, if you accept this, this fact, Then, um, here's the positive line bundle. This Vamsi was alluding to this, but he never got around to it. So suppose you have your, your Riemann surface. Okay, just take a point on this surface. Call it P. A point is a smooth submanifold of the Riemann surface. And so therefore, by what we did in... Uh, maybe the first lecture, there's a line bundle L sub P. Okay? And I claim that this line bundle has a metric of positive curvature. Okay? So the first thing is, uh, so if, of course, every line bundle has a smooth metric, it's just a partition of unity argument, just like every manifold has a Riemannian metric, it's the same kind of argument. So if you take uh, H, a metric, for uh, LP, in fact, for any line bundle, then uh, so the integral of the curvature, so square root of minus 1 times the curvature of H, okay? this is some number which is independent of H. So that's going to be one of the exercises. Okay, so um, okay, um, and so now, so now let's take some omega. This is going to be a differential form of degree two, and because you're on a compact manifold, the integral of that is finite. So maybe by rescaling, we can make the integral equal to 1. So, in fact, I claim that this number here, if you divide by 2 pi, this is actually equal to 1. So this will be exercise, in fact, as well. And both of those things will be an exercise. Okay, so it's a fun exercise, actually. Okay, so now um, you look at this curvature, square root of minus 1 over 2 pi theta of this initial metric that you chose h, and then you subtract omega from it, and this has integral 0. Right? So it means, by the thing that I've asked you to accept, that in fact it's equal to square root of minus 1, say, over 2 pi d d bar u. So that u has to be multiplied by 2 pi to get this one. So now I claim uh, that this implies that the square root of minus 1, 2 pi theta of e to the minus u, u is a globally defined function. So if I multiply by met my metric by e to the minus u, uh, this will be uh, another metric. And I claim that the curvature of this metric is just omega. So is that right? Let's see. Maybe it's plus. Plus. The curvature of this metric, we, we, I claimed yesterday, maybe I even sort of proved, no, I left it as an exercise, that this is equal to the curvature of H plus, or rather minus, dd bar of u. So now you can see. Okay. So there it is. If you, in fact, if you specify any uh, smooth positive form, you can find a metric for this line bundle, so whose integral is 1, you can find a metric for this line bundle 
um, whose curvature is that smooth form. So actually you can quite very much control the curvature if you know this Hodge theorem. So, sorry for going a few minutes over time. So maybe we, you guys want to have some coffee and I will put up some exercises on the board. Thank you.